Hi, I'm Glennis Wilson, a senior clinical psychologist with specialties in trauma, neurodiversity, adolescents and young people. If you have any questions about this presentation, please contact me on this email address and it'll also be in the notes as well. So from approximately 2009 to 2014, when I left Melbourne University Counselling and Psychological Services, the university was in widespread change for all of those years. There had been ongoing change at almost every level across all of the years. Um, there was little communication about what it meant other than there would be jobs less lost, but nothing about what level, when and where the costs and restructure would happen. Um, there was lots of talk about consultation with very little real information. So really after a short time, people were very worn down, morale was poor and loyalty to the institution was in tatters. I was one of four people doing mental health and such training through this period. And almost every training that we did had to address staff anxiety, anger, frustration and confusion, often before we could even start the training or session on what we were supposed to be there for. We also saw staff in our service and lots of sessions were around staff handling stress and ambiguity. And I learned a lot about how change should be managed in institutions, how it actually was handled and what it meant to manage other people's stress and be supportive while I was also in the same boat as those I was training and counselling. Change, especially in these financially stricken times, is also it's happening across most educational and health settings. You're likely watching this video because you're in a similar situation. We've all been through and are still going through a period of change due to COVID-19, but this is coming on top of other changes that are already happening at many institutions. I'm aiming at a practical session where we look at change, its effect on staff, especially when not handled well, and how you can try and ameliorate its impact on yourself and your team. Add to the above scenario, the current situation where staff are by and large working from home, and so even more isolated and cut off from information and support, and it's far more difficult to manage your team and your own anxiety. Decisions of management are also being communicated via email, maybe audio video links, which rob the situation of the feeling of a common humanity. There are exercises with this presentation that you'll be able to do later. They're all worthwhile and could be done with the whole team during a video meeting. Going from individual change and then looking at the research already done in family systems. And so they started applying those to how those theories and models could be adapted for organisations. Now organisations are designed and run by people with all their personal histories, strategies, motivations, expectations and desires. So badly handled change affects productivity, loyalty and staff retention. There's a huge, vast industry of cons consultants vying for the job of assessing works practices and restructuring them. Most of the models seem to come from the manager's view where they have a say in the change or have access to feedback from senior management. Interestingly and possibly worrying is a point that many of the guides and articles in the list um, is why the importance to have a plan for change and why it's needed. Um, I would have thought that should be fairly basically the first thing done. Do look and see for yourself if your workplace has a change management policy so you can refer to it when you feel it's not being followed. The issue of what drives structural change is a very important one. Does the change make sense? Uh, it impacts morale, cooperation, even a successful uh, outcome. If it's changed just for change's sake, to stamp a new manager's or VC's mark on the university, or driven like vague statements like more streamlined, responsive, flexible, um, it's hard to get staff excited. Budget cuts may be the real motivation or a change in direction for the university, then that is better said directly. It may not be liked, but it gives people more time to adapt their thinking, expectations and plans. Exercise one is the sort of exercise that's been around for decades. It's 
loosely um, you can look at it as locus of control theory. Um, think of the Serenity Prayer written by uh, Reinhold Nabier, an American pastor in the uh, 20s and early 1930s. And it sort of talks about the circles of influence. Um, grant me the serenity to change the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. This exercise aims to get you to refocus from what is overwhelming and frustrating and what you actually can do to help you feel more satisfied and effective. Hopefully the inner circle grows to lessen the emotional impact of the outer circle. And details of this ex exercise will be available in a separate handout, but allow 20 to 30 minutes to do it. It's a very effective one and really helps you focus from the overwhelming things you cannot impact on to the smaller, more personal things that you can do that will change things and make you maybe feel a little bit more powerful in your situation. Virginia Satire, uh, Satire's model in family therapy, um, it acknowledges there's a period of uncertainty, chaos even, when change is implemented. And it has a really interesting model where you look at um, the old status quo. The foreign element is um, the disruptive element. That could be a new manager, a new VC, or an incident that highlights poor functioning aspects of the old status quo. Um, and in the latter, latter case, there's less likely to be resistance, but possibly arguments about how the new system or what the new system will be and how it's adopt, adopted. In the former cases, which is just the new manager or VC or such, um, there may be reasons for the resistance, which include personality clashes, mismatch expectations, questioning of why the change is needed and the manner in which the process is being handled. These issues, if combined with a lack of planning and or poor communication, can result in chaos and volatility. The longer these two periods continue, the worse the impact on staff and the less likely a successful outcome. I had a training um, as an incident responder for a worldwide uh, company that I work with in the aftermath of disasters. And the one thing this company constantly tests you on and deliberately sets things up is the ability to deal with ambiguity and how flexible you can be under pressure. And this is one of the most stressful things people have to deal with, the not knowing, the not having um, a clear direction or a clear rationale behind what's happening. And you can think of it too in the type of stress a person on the autistic spectrum has in social situations, constant ambiguous messages with little or no rules to guide. It's anxiety provoking, hugely draining and a loss of motivation and fear of making the wrong move to making no move. The real and serious impact of uncertainty, confusion, lack of instruction or leadership is almost de debilitating over time for people and therefore organisations. Looking at each stage of the Satya model, you can see that um, point one, late, late status quo, if you encourage people to seek concepts, improvement, information from outside the group, it prepares the group to deal positively with change. I would add that an honest discussion about what needs to happen with a realistic look at how likely this is to have an effect, giving some avenue for meaningful, honest discussion can lessen the likelihood of fear-based rumours, gossip and guessing about what's going to happen. People become resistant if they don't understand or if they are left to make up and they will gossip or they don't understand why it's happening. At least if they know there's no good reason for it happening, they know how to set their expectations um, and they'll be prepared for a chaotic period and hopefully looking forward after to integration and a new status quo where they will feel safe and secure. Unfortunately, I've had far more experience of how not to affect change than effective collaborative change. An example, one of my um, senior managers, a very popular and effective manager, had a meeting 
with one of the top people in the Provost office before a major meeting with the rest of the staff. And it was when the, it was over there, they were in there for an hour. And it was when the new management structure was put up in the meeting in front of everyone that my manager found out that his job wasn't in there. He was being sacked. There was no warning. He was then asked to oversee the initial phases of the implement, implementation. Now this restructure meant 600 people remained redundant. Many more left in anger. Three years later, they had to hire 900 people to replace them. They hadn't thought about the loss of knowledge and the loss of loyalty. Um, so you've got, under those circumstances, management um, really can't expect the workforce to embrace change. So it's up to you on the middle management or within your team level to talk about it realistically, to let people vent, not endlessly, but to talk about frustration and look at ways this frustration can be managed. Um, regarding a timetable for changes, I worked with a rural faculty of 19 people that had been told there would be changes and that there would only be 11 positions available. They weren't told the criteria for assessing jobs. They weren't told how it would be done. There was no time frame, no rationale and no outcome ex explained. When I visited them to do some mental health first aid training, they'd been operating under this system for 18 months. Home purchases put off, pregnancy plans affected, new car purchases, their lives were on hold and they were furious. Local management was staff, were drained and broken trying to buffer the staff and central management was stunned and surprised at a lack of cooperation. The impact of powerlessness and lack of knowledge about how well you do makes you feel undervalued. Again, the loyalty, the belief that what you do matters is counterproductive to a good outcome. Whoever is retained, they'll be far less likely to work after hours and yet many health and education organisations depend on the goodwill of the staff to do so much in their own time and to care about students or patients. Now, change versus transformation. And this is a really good point. You can have a few areas managing discrete changes, but once these changes intersect or affect the majority of the organisation, it's a transformation, a totally different thing. Managers are expected to undertake all that's needed, mostly on top of their usual workload. And at the uni I worked at, there were major changes happening in a few areas, restructuring, amalgamation of student centres, reduction of disability services, a review of administrative services right across the university, and a change in direction of two major faculties, all intersected and yet were considered separate events. The ability to, to respond was hampered by the fact that management of the university saw them as unrelated, discrete changes. They said, there was no transformation happening because at the university wide level, like in a public statement that the university was going to do something totally different, that wasn't happening. And yet it was an absolute transformation. Now, exercise two, we need to consider personalities in terms of the teams in the team. So, look at the role people play, but please be sensitive and constructive in your discussions. If you're a manager, you need to know how to handle different people, how to challenge them, congratulate them and so on. And a manager's personality and management style can have huge implications on how well the team copes in stressful times. Please keep this um, a positive, even though you may not always feel, at least then put your critiques in a constructive manner allow 20 to 30 minutes. This exercise should possibly be titled Managing Poor Implementation of Change, but what do individuals and teams need at times of change? If, even if it's relatively well handled, people are often still stressed and confused by the process. So clarity is one thing that really is needed both in this exercise and in 
managing change. Again, allow 20 to 30 minutes. I'm really aware that here I've talked of theories and possibly different ways upper management could manage change. This may be above your range of influence, but there are things to do and ways to act that can make a significant difference to the way your team members um, experience challenging difficult times. If you think you can pass this information to um, people above you in the, uh, the chain, then please do. Let them know that when they do something right, uh, let them know that it's really appreciated when they keep you informed on things. Really don't just um, accept the email, send one back saying, thanks a lot, this helps. Let them know why it helps you to know what's happening in the overall scheme of things when a time frame's given, things like that. It may help change things a little bit more for the better. Finally, we've got the, the references. Now this includes references from that I've used in the, uh, in the presentation, plus other web pages that might be of interest. There is so much stuff out there. Um, please look up things for yourself. There might be more uh, recent things. Um, there would certainly be, I'm sure. And make certain they come from, um, if you want, uh, valid and good sources and not just somebody's um, stream of thought, um, like you're getting from me. Um, so please, thank you very much uh, for looking at this, and I really hope it was useful. As said before, if you wish to uh, ask questions, then please contact me on the uh, email address at the top and in the notes. Thank you.